realize I carry this all the way from Cambridge, eh? Good morning. Good to be with you. I heard that last week you had the Pope here. It's kind of like, uh, now I'm back, it's kind of like going from Winston Churchill to Donald Duck. So, Steve's a good friend, so I'm sure it was a blessing. You know what? Let me pray for Ukraine. Amen? You know, we've had a lot of talk in our country about freedom and feeling freedom's been imposed upon. Uh, I hope that we look at Ukraine and we take a sober second look because these people are fighting for their lives to be free. Wow. Let's pray. Father God, we lift up this country that has been on your heart for a very, very long time. And Father, we pray that your will be done and that the kingdom would come in a new way in the midst of the chaos. And so, Father, we pray for brothers and sisters in Ukraine this morning who want to be salt and light and things just seem to be unraveling around them. And Father, we know that you are sovereign, that your good will will prevail even when circumstances seem to deny that. Father, we pray for President Putin that you would break into his heart and heart, that you would superintend there, and that he would have a sober second thought about what all is happening. You can do that. We know that you hold the heart of the ruler in your hand. So we trust you, Lord. We cry out to you. Father, help your servant this morning. Anoint my lips, clarify my thoughts, prepare our hearts and minds for what you have to say so that when we've le left here this day, we've been with Jesus. And it's in his name and for his glory alone that we pray. Amen. And amen. Open your Bibles, if you would. We're going to continue in our Upper Room series, This We Know. And this morning, we're going to talk about what it's like when the world hates you, they don't like me because I love Jesus. They don't appreciate the way I have oriented my life. So John chapter 15, I'm going to read a fairly lengthy passage here, so stay with me and... Uh, and then we'll dive in. Okay, hear the word of the Lord, John chapter 15, beginning at verse 18. This is the Lord Jesus, of course, speaking. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they do to you on the account of my name because they do not know him who sent me. If I had come and spoken to them, pardon me, if I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now that they have seen and hated both me and my father. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. But when the helper comes, who I set, whom I will send to you from the father, the spirit of truth, who, who proceeds from the father, he will bear witness about me, and you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. 
And they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. But I have said these things to you that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. I did not say these things to you in the beginning because I was with you. This is God's word. Let me ask you a question this morning. What do you hate? Go ahead. What do you hate? Tell me what you hate. Go ahead. This is your chance to talk in church. Okay, what do you hate? War. War. Yeah, amen. What else? Pardon me? Injustice? Sin? Lies? We're sounding all very spiritual. Nobody said spiders and snakes yet. What's that? Face masks. Face masks. <laughs> Can I get an amen? <laughs> oh, my. I'm going to stop before it gets worse. I asked a group of people that this week. I said, what do you hate? My son said, I hate silly quizzes like the one you've just asked me. (laughs) This passage that we've read from the lips of Jesus talks quite a bit about hate, depending on what translation you read, many, many, many times. Hate is an intense feeling of aversion or enmity. That's what it is. We often use the word fairly flippantly and casually. In fact, in the Old Testament, we read that God hates many things. Idol worship, liturgy without sincerity, injustice, and listen to this. Even in the book of Hosea, it actually says he hates sinners. Now, there's something you, you might have to wrap your theological brain around. Jesus rejects hate. This most basic of human emotions in our relationships and insists on the positive counterpart to that, which is, of course, love, even to the extent of doing good to those who hate you. Luke chapter 8, verse 27 is your go-to. The reality of discipleship, and this is kind of paradoxical, but the reality of discipleship is that we are actually called to hate our own lives. Galatians 2.20, be crucified with Christ, therefore you don't longer live. In fact, God even says there's a hierarchical to your Christian relationships, and you must love the Lord Jesus above everybody else. It's pretty significant. But for the world, they will hate. And Jesus here is moving in this upper room discourse from the promises and protections of life when he is gone to look in the face of what they're going to be facing when they end up living as followers of his without his physical presence. So the emotion Jesus is talking about is this strong aversion, this deep enmity towards the people that identify with him, followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And verse 18 there tells us, chapter 15, if you find the godless world is hating you, this is from the message I'm reading, this particular translation. Remember, it got its start hating me. If Jesus, friends, is your rescuer and your healer and your hero, and you make sure people know that reality, you will pay a relational price at some point in your life journey. Without a doubt. Now let's walk through the passage, and what I'd like to do is I want to begin at the end, okay? with the reason why Jesus shared, which I've just read. So look, chapter 16, verse 1. Jesus said, I told you these things to prepare you for rough times ahead. They're going to throw you out of the synagogues. They're going to throw you out of the meeting places. They're going to come a time when people kill you, thinking that that's actually a service to God, killing Christians. We've seen that. We've seen that in such stark reality in some places in the world. And he says, I've told you these things so that when that time comes... And they start in on you, you will be well warned and ready for them. Now, there's a qualifier to this, right? We are talking about being rejected because you are reflecting Jesus. This is different from being rejected because you are a jerk. Okay? I'll come back to that. Jesus was never rejected for being a jerk. 
Now let's go back to the beginning. First word, if. If. If possibly, or if maybe, it, it might happen. By adding that word, you know, Jesus actually opens a bit of a, an escape hatch, right? And the truth is, many of us here this morning, many of us may have had no experience or, or stories of hate in your life as a result of your faith in Jesus. Now, what generates that hate? We read in verse 18, didn't we? If you were of the world, the world would love you, but you're not. You have calibrated your life, your mind, your thinking to the word of God to the life of Jesus, as opposed to the culture around you, and he's chose you out of the world for that purpose, and therefore the world hates you. Right? And that's where he reiterates what he's already said. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, you're a follower of me, yeah, they're going to persecute you too. So the ultimate reason for the world's hatred of Jesus is that he testifies that his deeds are evil. That's John 7, 7. Right? Jesus says, you know, but it hates me because their works are evil. The works of the world are evil. And that is true. And, and at the moment they became his ambassadors, that hate is now transferred to them. And a life aligned with Christ, friends, sooner or later, will generate some heat. A Christ-centered life, this is in your notes, is a rebuke of the evil in the world. And that's where the orientation of the hate begins. Now, I want to give you four reasons this morning why the world hates the follower of Jesus. Now, listen very carefully. I've chose my words carefully. Why the world hates the follower of Jesus, not the believer in Jesus. Did you know the devil believes in Jesus? It's a far different thing to be a follower of the Lord Jesus than to be a fan of the Lord Jesus. A follower of the Lord Jesus is deeply committed, devoted to reflecting Jesus in every area of their life. That's just different than, hey, is Jesus cool, man? So let me give you four reasons. Number one, we've already read it. Because we identify with Christ. When he departs the world, the target is moved onto us as the recipient of Satan's attack. Once in a while, somebody will say this to me. I used to hear it when I was pastoring. You know, they'd say to me, do you know I worked with Bob for 14 years and I never knew Bob was a Christian? Isn't that crazy? And I go, that's heartbreaking. That's heartbreaking. Absolutely heartbreaking. It's a disaster. You could have witnessed together in your workplace. You could have strategized together. You, and most importantly, you could have done what? Prayed together. That God's will would be done and his kingdom would come where you two work together. But if they would identify with Christ, yeah, some people are going to reject that and reject them. Second reason why the world hates is because of your separation from the world. If you were of the world, it says there in verse 19, the world would love you as its own. Therefore, this is a rebuke, quite frankly, of those who are unbelievers. Right? Because you have separated from the world. Third reason the world will hate you. Because of an ignorance of God. Look at verse 21 there, chapter 15. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name because they did not know him who sent me. They don't know the Father. And because of that, you know, you are, you're an alien and you're a Christian. You're kind of dangerous. Right? People don't really know what to do with you. And this, frankly, friends, is where it's easy to be a jerk, right? When you see people, they have an ignorance of God. They're just clued out when it comes to the things of the Lord. And it's easy to be a jerk, right? Let me tell you a story. When I was pastoring uh, at our church, uh, we were approached by a group that wanted to open a school in Waterloo Region for children with autism that were on the spectrum. There was no school in Waterloo Region for kids with autism. So this group came to us, 
uh, led by a lady who's immensely gifted and capable in this whole area. She had worked with families individually, but she got this passion to start a school. So she came to us, wanted to start this school, and uh, <clears throat> brought all these experts. We had doctors and psychologists, and we came and they looked at our church because they needed a place that's very unique, like you have here at Temple. You know, you've got gymnasium and everything. And so they came and uh, they wanted to start this school. And we had this meeting, and uh, <clears throat> You know, so finally I'm sitting there, you know, and, and they're like, you know, these people are Christians. They're looking at us like, ooh, it's kind of weird, right? And finally somebody gets up the nerve and says, uh, why do you people actually want to do this? Like, because we know it's going to be super inconvenient. I actually said they could come for the first year at no rent. Just come. Why, why do you, like, what's in this for you? Like, what's behind all of this? And there was probably 10 or 12 of them in the room. And I said, well, you, don't, you won't understand this because you're pagans. You're evil loving. You're infidels. And, and I hope you light campfires because where you're headed, it's going to be hot. I don't mean Hawaii hot. I mean really hot. Now, the reality of that is it's true. But... It's just being a jerk. So they asked me this question, and I got all eyes on me, and I said, <clears throat> you probably know that we're Jesus freaks. That's the term I used. We're actually, we're, we're head over heels, crazy about Jesus. And it is strikingly obvious to me how much you love these kids and how much you care about these kids. And did you know that Jesus actually loves your kids actually more than you do. And, and because we're Jesus freaks, we're followers of Jesus, we get really jazzed about loving the things that Jesus loves. So our agenda in this, we want you to know is, if you set up your school here in our church, I'll only make you one problem, promise. That we'll love your kids. We'll just love your kids. We won't try and teach them anything religious or doctrine. We'll just love your kids. And I know want you, you want your kids to be loved. And we'd be honored to love your kids. And finally, somebody said, sounds good to me. They've been there six, seven years. They just started a high school in the church building. So there's 60, 70 kids. None of these people are of faith, but God has allowed that to open a door. Number four, the conviction of sin. The conviction of sin. Revelation, as Jesus has told us, brings responsibility, right? You respond to God's revelation by either moving closer to God and embracing truth, or you move farther away from God as an act of rejection, right? And that leads ultimately to the ultimate rejection, the unforgivable sin. Some people say, oh, if you use the Lord's name in vain, it's not. No, it's not. The unforgivable sin is the ultimate rejection of Christ. If you ultimately reject Christ, there is nothing for you in eternity except separation from God. Everything else, Jesus' blood covers. Amen? Amen. We as followers are to walk in light, right? If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, the Lord Jesus, of course, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us all from sin. But there are those that are in darkness. They reject the light, right? John chapter 3. The light came into the world and brought judgment on the world. So let me make this personal just for a couple of minutes. This is when you wish you had just went to the restroom. Let me ask you three questions. I'm asking myself these three questions. If we're to live this life of holiness, separated from the world, called out by Jesus, first question is this. What of this world have I rejected this week to honor Jesus? What of this world have I rejected this week to honor Jesus? Dads, listen. Dads, if your dad nod. 
Do you ever say in your house, Dad, we're not going to watch this TV show anymore? Because this is not fitting of something that should be played in a Christian home. Because what they think is funny actually grieves the heart of God. And so we're not going to be watching, hmm, anymore. Dad, you take a stand. I did that in my house. What have you rejected this week of the world, right? And you can reject places and products and plans, and sometimes that means you have to reject the company of certain people. Not as a jerk, but just say, you know what, you're headed there, and you know, and listen carefully. What is legal is often immensely immoral. It used to be, some of you folks here are, are in your golden years, I'll move on. Uh, and you remember that when things that were illegal were usually based on morality, right? But that's all changed. There's lots of things that are legal that are completely immoral, and now it's gone one step forward. Not only are the things that are uh, legal immoral, often they're very accessible. Your kid can have them on their phone, right? Right? Second question, when this week have you made this relationship with Christ known? Re recognizing that there's opportunities that exist, right? Prompted by the Spirit, there's opportunities. When this week have you made it known that, hey, you know, like, I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm a Jesus freak. I mean, I love Jesus, man. He's changed my life, right? Have you done that in the past week? Third question. When have I been the most like Jesus by way of countercultural blessing? By way of countercultural blessing. When have you been like Jesus by way of countercultural blessing, where you have responded to people and needs regardless of the outcome? Friday, I had to go to the doctor to get an injection. Now you're all saying, what did he get an injection for? Wonder what? Okay, I'll tell you. It was Botox. Do my lips look fuller? <laughs> I had to get an injection. And remember I told you about smashing my foot? It's never been right since. So now I have to get it. It needs surgery, but surgery is like 18 months out, right? Because it's all backed up. So I had to get an injection in my foot. Actually, I had to get both feet done. But one's really bad, the one that got smashed. It's a shame that you... What, what, what's the old saying? It's a shame that youth is wasted on the young or something like that. So I go to the doctor's office in Hamilton for this injection, and the physician's assistant, young guy, he come, the doctor comes in, he says, well, you know, uh, this guy will take care of you. And he comes in, nice young guy, and, and uh, he sits down, and we get talk, and he says, uh, you know, uh, he looks, he says, yeah, you know, you, yeah, you, you really do need, ultimately you need the surgery, we're going to try and buy you some more time. So we're talking a bit, and, uh, and I'm talking to him, and he says, uh, do you know, you should be a storyteller. That's what he says, right out of the blue. And I said, that's an interesting thing. And uh, he says, uh, I said, oh, yeah, really? And he goes, yeah. I said, well, that's interesting. He said, yeah, you know what? He says, you remind me of Morgan Freeman. <laughs> well, first of all, Morgan Freeman's 85 years old. I said, get the Botox, right, if I look like Morgan Freeman. I mean, come on, man. I said, oh, really? I said, you know what? I said, well, actually, I said, I'm a preacher. And he goes, really? Because I'm a Christian. And he said, I go to so-and-so church. I said, that's really cool. And we had this neat little talk about, you know, church and whatnot. And I thought, if he was so readily offering that off his lips to me, right, he was probably telling, you know, he lived his Christian life in this busy orthopedic surgery place office, right? So he says to me, okay, the injections are going to be $50, and then we do ultrasound, so we get the injection in the right spot, so it'll be $90. Great. I said, I'd pay you $500. These things are so sore. So anyways, I go, and I go out to the front counter, and the girl at the front counter says, oh, okay, Mr. Adams, okay, it's $50 today. And I said, no, actually, it's supposed to be $90. And she goes, oh, really? Did you have ultrasound done on your feet? And I go, yeah. Oh, she said, he forgot to write that down. And I said, oh, yeah, he never did it. No, I'm just kidding. I said, no, he did it. And she goes, she goes, I am, I'm so surprised that you would tell me that. 
And I said, you know what? I said, you know, our character should be worth more than 40 bucks, right? She goes, yeah, but you know people. <laughs> and you know, it never occurred to me, friends, until I went out and got in my car, and I thought, this young guy who's trying to live like Jesus, what if in a conversation, two things had come up? That guy is a Christian, and that guy didn't pay the right amount, and he knew, because I had the revelation, like you have responsibility, I knew full well it was 90 bucks, not 50. So, you know, that's one of the things you do is you offer countercultural blessing to those around you, including this young guy, even when he calls you Morgan Freeman. <laughs> so I encourage you, church, to make your rejections known. Not in a mean-spirited, I'm better than you way. And to make your relationship with Jesus known and to act with countercultural love. And if you commit to those three dynamics, you will get some hate coming your way. There will be times when hate will come your way, but that's okay. If you were of the world, the world would love you, Jesus said, as its own. And if the world is loving you and you never ever experience any hate, let me just say this gently, but let me say this. Clearly, it could be because you are too aligned with the culture of our world. I'm going to tell you that. That can happen. Okay, and I speak the truth in love when I say that. Because I'm not sure that some of the hate we generate is always without a cause. Sometimes we definitely, we do bring it on ourselves. Now, <clears throat> how do we respond to the hostility? is we become witnesses, friends, of the truth of our message by being like Jesus, who in John 1.14, son of the Father, full of, do you know the two words? Full of grace and truth, married together. Always married together. Right? That's where we read it. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, the son of only the Father, full of grace and truth, walking side by side. Because with light, there's always heat, right? You always get heat when you bring light. When you shine light into darkness, yeah, things lighten up. But there's heat that comes with that. So how do you, how do you deal with the hostility? If you're living out your Christian life and there's some relational pushback, what do you do? First thing you do is you realize that you can live your life by the Holy Spirit empowering and guiding you. That's what Jesus said there in verse 26. But when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. He'll actually bear witness through you, empower you, and guide you when you walk in step with him. That is why it's so important. We talked about this, I think, two or three weeks ago for the Holy Spirit to have his way in you. Amen? So that he can do that. He can help you and empower you and give you courage. When you stand for Christ in a way that is Christ-like, then the Spirit has freedom to move and to work and help you. In Acts chapter 4, Peter and John get arrested, right, for preaching in Solomon's portico. You can, if you've never been to Israel, I, I hope to go in November again. I've been half a dozen times, but I want to go one more time. If you'd like to come with me, I'd love to take you. I'll take you up onto the Temple Mount, even though most Christians never go up there because the Christian tours won't take you up there because it's, it's uh, run by Muslims, and, and, and they don't want to take you up there, but I always go up there. I, I'll tell you an interesting story about going up there once, one time. Um, so I'll make you want to come back, possibly. But uh, they heal a beggar, right? A lame beggar in Solomon's portico, and it infuriates the high priest, and they're arrested, and the next day they stand before the Sadducees, right? And uh, they, uh, they're asked about, what power did you do this in, guys? Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit. This, remember, this is, I'm denying Jesus three times, Peter. Same Peter, same guy. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, and then he's going to tell it to them straight. And he does. 
And what was the outcome in verse 13? And when they saw the boldness, this is not arrogance. It's not spiritual high-mindedness. It's not a condescending attitude. It was just boldness, grace and truth. When they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they hadn't even been to seminary. They were astounded. And they recognized they had been, do you know what it says next? With Jesus. Wow. So beautiful. So the Spirit will empower and guide you in the hostility. Second, believers returning daily to the mission of Jesus. How do you deal with the hostility is every day you return back to the mission of Jesus for you and you remind yourself and you come back to the cross every day and say, I've died to self, I'm living for Christ, the Spirit of God, Christ in me, and you know what? My mission is to be salt and light in this world regardless, and that's my mission God, help me to do that today. And that's why it says, and you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. Are you, friends, aligned enough with Christ and sold out enough to Christ to be hated by the world around you? You know, a couple of weeks ago, I, I started my sermon and, and I think I talked about that you... Uh, you can get by with a little help from your friends. Do you remember that? You actually can thrive with a little hate from your friends. Let me tell you a story and I'll be done. I was at uh, ground zero 10 days after 9-11, right down in the heart of the thing, meeting with church leaders and I had friends there and everybody remembers 9-11. If you're under 20, I guess you wouldn't, or maybe under 25 or so you wouldn't. And I was right down there. I'll never forget it, friends. The smell, the smell is the thing that would just permeated my mind. And the noises and the chaos. And I had been to New York City many, I'd been in the World Trade Center. And it was just mind boggling. But it was when I was there, I first heard about a guy by the name of Al Bracca. Al Bracca. Al Bracca was a vice president at Cantor Fitzgerald. You know that company? Lost dozens of its staff because they had the fanciest offices in one of the towers and the plane hit below and so they were cut off, right? Well, Al Bracca was in the 104th floor. Can you imagine that? It's a long way if you forget something in the car. Wow. He worked there at Cantor Fitzgerald for 16 years. He was on the phone, actually, in the office when all of a sudden this ear-splitting explosion happened in the background. And the person on the phone with Al heard people yelling in the background, evacuate, evacuate, and then the landlines went dead. They were the last words spoken by Al Bracca to anyone who knew him, by, by Al Bracca to anyone who knew him well because the plane had fit, hit at the 90th floor and they were in 104. People were trapped. They were trapped. And as you saw news reports, some were trying to get up onto the roof. Some would go to the windows because of the fire. And sadly, some even, it was so horrific, so horrible, they actually jumped as an alternative, which is, a, you know, as you know, no alternative. Of course, they didn't make it. Al's wife, Jeannie, knew by the end of the day that her husband has died because Al would have, she said, never left me to suffer all day long if he'd been alive, so I knew he was gone. Now, Cantor Fitzgerald is a high-powered brokerage firm where power and money were first and foremost. And things like marriage and kids and certainly God became low priority. Many of Al's co-workers called Al the Rev. Half out of affection and half out of derision. Because they noticed that though he was part of that company, he lived a very different life. And he paid a price for that. In fact, his wife Jeannie said there were some days he actually didn't even want to go into the office. Because... For many years, people had made fun of his faith. They did crude things, unkind things. They would put screensavers, 
things on his computer screen that were profane and rude. And, thank you, and times, they just often generally disrespected him for his faith. And he was very open to his colleagues about his faith and his love for God and what Jesus had done in his life. And some co-workers harassed him about his morality. Remember, Jesus said, you know, if you were of the world, they'd love you, man, but you're not. You're different. You're called out. You're one of mine. So they're not going to like that, and they didn't like that in Al. At the same time, when nobody's around, some would individually come, hey, Al, can you pray for my marriage? Can you pray for my one kid? Can you? It was sort of this sort of passive-aggressive deal, right? In 1993, when the World Trade Centers were bombed the first time, Al was there helping people get down the stairs. It took three hours to walk all the way down. Can you imagine that? And as people passed by him in the halls, they were yelling at him in the stairways. Hey, Rev, pray for us, eh? Because they needed that when they were in trouble. And he'd respond by telling, I already am. In his last moments on this earth, Al continued his obedient journey to the Lord Jesus. After the plane hit the tower on September 11th, according to spouses that were able to call out on cell phones, these were spouses of co-workers that ultimately died with Al, the Rev got anybody who was interested into a circle and said, let's hold hands and we're going to pray. There's reports that he shared the gospel and some of those people gave their life to Christ. Is that something? As usual, he thought of others more than himself because that's what life in Christ is about. And he stepped into eternity, ready to meet his Lord face to face, bringing with him some of those he had prayed for for years and endured for years. Can you imagine? What a way to go, eh? Must have been such a lovely moment for Al. His family, his wife and kids said, he, he was not afraid to die. Serving the Lord, what a way to go for him. Friends, let me encourage you to embrace the holiness of the world's rejection. To have hope in times when you're hated. Confidently and graciously and with the Spirit's leading and directing every word and every action. And yes, yes, God will use it for the glory of his name and for the building of his kingdom. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we love you. Father, thank you for people who live their lives the way that Al Bracca did and endure the rejection and the hatred at times of the world. And in so doing, though, in some unusual way, they gain themselves opportunity when it counts. May that be our experience, Lord as we calibrate our minds, our hearts, our lives to yours. Father God, may you use us. May we stand firm, full of grace and truth for the Lord Jesus and be the aroma of Christ to all that we meet. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.